So that's uh, three o'clock now. This is David Henty. I'm in charge of training at EPCC. I'm not today's speaker, but I think we'll just wait a couple of minutes because there's a really good attendance and I, people are often coming in a bit late. Is that okay, Andy? Maybe wait two or three more minutes. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Get started. Um, I'll maybe just um, do the boring stuff, which people don't mind missing. Um, just as you obviously, this is a, a presentation as part of the Archer service. Um, these sessions are, are quite regular. We typically have uh, at least one a month. And I think we're, we are planning one for the end of this month, which hasn't quite been announced yet, but but the, the current plan is to have, towards the end of March, uh, to have a session on talking about uh, the meltdown bug, uh, what it is and its in potential impact on performance. Uh, that's building on some work, which a few people in EPCC, including Andy, have, have been doing. Um, but um, said so these are regular presentations. We're recording the session, that's so we can put the video up online afterwards, uh, just so you're aware of that. And we, uh, we, we do try and record the chat window just so that um, when we put the video up afterwards, um, it, it makes it, if Andy gets a question, it's nice to, to show the question in the stream so it makes sense if people are watching it uh, in, in a, uh, uh, on the recording. But just to say, we are recording the session and um, it will go up on the web um, within, within a week or so. It takes a while to process it. Um, uh, during the session, you can ask questions with audio, but experience has shown that people seem to really prefer the chat window. And that, that does work quite well. So if you want to ask, feel free to ask questions during this. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A and afterwards, afterwards. But if you do have a, a question during the session, there's a little speech bubble. There's a, depending on how you've launched the, the, the session, there is a, a little arrow in the bottom right hand corner, open collaborate pa panel. And at the very left of the, the menu options at the bottom, there's a speech bubble. If you go there, you'll see the chat and you'll also be able to type something in. And um, we get an audio notification of that. I'll, I'll be on this. So, so Andy may or may not, it's not um, notice it, but if he hasn't, I'll maybe remind him. So, so please feel free to put chat questions in uh, during the presentation or you're welcome to wait till the end. We can maybe try audio questions at the end. It's just that audio can sometimes go a bit funny and get a bit of a feedback issues. But um, I'm pretty, we've got a really good um, attendance over 20 people on the session. That's great. So um, I make it a few minutes past. I don't know, Andy, do you want to maybe kick off now or do you want to wait a few more yeah, minutes? Yeah, I'll get started. I mean, okay. yeah. It was a balance between letting people start to join and um, yeah. let, not letting people having to hang around uh, waiting. For okay, so over to Andy. Cool, thanks David. So as David says, my, my name is Andy Ten. I work here at APCC on various projects. Um, my role in Archer is I lead the CSE team um, currently, who are the people who answer the sort of the technical queries, perform technical assessments, um, all those sorts of things. But I also have roles on um, a lot of the other HPC, National HPC services run. So um, as I mentioned in this talk, uh, there's um, the Dirac facility, which is for STFC research, and also um, the tier two national facilities. Um, we have one of those called Cirrus, and I have a role there um, look, helping look after the service and make sure it runs uh, correctly. So um, I'm going to talk about various things today. So there's a couple of logos here, EPCC, obviously, who's I, who I work for, and HPC UK, um, which has become, which is a, amongst other things, a community uh, website which contains information on a lot of the different facilities available um, to UK research, UK-based researchers. Um, actually, the title of this talk should really be HPC facilities for UK-based researchers. I realised as I was sitting there that it's not quite right to say UK researchers, but it's for everybody based in the UK mostly. Uh, so let me get on with the talk. So. There's just a note here that this uh, talk's uh, available under Creative Commons license. In fact, you can even clone and fork it if you want to use it yourself or want to um, improve it or change it for um, your your own your own local people. If that's useful for you, you can do that. Um, it's all web-based and it's all available on GitHub. So I'm going to talk um, firstly about uh, the open calls. The calls are available now. Why are we doing this presentation right now um, rather than any other time? A bit about the different UK HPC facilities that are available. So um, Archer, which I hope um, which many people know about, Dirac, which I mentioned, the tier two facilities and other stuff that's available. Uh, I've got a few slides on how you might get advice on how to use or use the systems or even which ones to apply for or you know what's out there. And then just a bit of a summary at the end. 
So the open calls at the moment, the reason we're doing this, this particular webinar right now is that currently the RAP uh, calls for open, RAP stands for a resource allocation panel, and it's a lightweight process for getting access to large amounts of HPC resource. So if you want to access Archer or the tier two HPC systems, and um, the RAP calls are currently open, for they close on the 10th of April um, with a technical assessment due into whichever help desk for the system you're applying to by the 22nd of March. And these cover the RAP projects are quite broad in terms of what they can fund. They're generally um, a year, I'm sorry, the maximum length they can be is a year. So they're quite short computational projects. The amount of effort to apply for them is less than a full, a lot less than a full grant application. It's simply an application form and a technical assessment form. Um, although they have to be led out of the UK, you can have uh, from um, institutions, you can have other users within the projects who are international or in, in, indeed industry partners as well. Um, you can get, it's a good way for students at experience of writing applications as well, because they can write the application be on it as a co-I um, with the with somebody else as a with a more experienced person as the PI. Um, and there's various other things it says here about feasibility studies, high risk, high reward. All this is available on the um, application website, which I'll provide links to later. But just to make you aware that that call is currently open, and there's a couple of weeks before the technical assessments have to be in uh, to be assessed. Hi everybody. So what facilities are available within the UK to UK based researchers in terms of HPC? So before I start, there's this commonly used terminology within HPC circles that is probably not so commonly used within um, research circles about different tiers of HPC. So in, within the UK, we tend to have um, what are called tier one facilities. These are the sort of the national scale collaborative HPC systems that a single, say, institution or a single region wouldn't be able to buy on its own. Very tend to be very large systems. Uh, tier three systems tend to be the institutional facilities, the facilities that um, a university may provide, like um, I don't know, University of Cambridge or so, any such thing. The tier two facilities are less well defined. Essentially, the best definition I can find is that they're somewhere between tier one and tier three, right? So you define them by their limits. In the UK, there they are systems that are larger generally than people provide as an institution, but smaller than the large capability resources, the tier one facilities. In fact, when this um, tiering model was set out, the, sorry, the only reason I raise this is because you'll often see things referred to as tier one and tier two. In fact, some of the facilities in the UK are, are explicitly referred to as tier two. So it's just to clarify where that comes from. Um, this tiering model was set up originally with these tier one, and then suddenly they realized they needed um, another tier above the national facilities for sort of pan-national facilities. Like there are European facilities that span, um, that are available across Europe. So they had to change from uh, the Fortran style numbering here from one, two, three, to a C style numbering, and they now start at tier zero. So you get tier zero facilities, which are sort of pan national facilities. And um, there are other facilities available, such as uh, public cloud based facilities. I won't talk about them in this presentation, but I'm happy to answer questions on as much as I know about what's available in the public cloud for HPC um, at the end, in particular. Um, and although they look very clean, the distinctions often blur between the different tiers. So a very large uh, research university might have a facility that's a bit bigger than, say, some of the tier two facilities in particular. And some of the tier two facilities may approach the size of a national facility. It just depends um, a, a bit on where, often where the funding comes from and what the remit of the service is, as well as facilities. Um, one of the problems that's been in the UK in the past is that there's all been, we're very well endowed in some sense in HPC facilities in the UK. There's a lot of institutional facilities. There's now the tier two facilities. There's Dirac and Archer, various other things. But one of the problems has been has been how to find out where what these facilities are and how to access them. And to try and address that, there's this um, open source community website called HPC UK, which lists all the lists the facilities that are nationally available. So it doesn't list all the institutional facilities because they're generally only available to people within their within their institution. But the things that are available nationally, which is the stuff I'm going to talk about in this presentation, um, they're listed on this website along with information about how to get more, more information on them, 
and what calls are open at the current time, where you can get support, various other bits and pieces. And as I say, this is an open source community developed resource. So anybody can um, clone the website and provide contributions back. So if they think they have useful information, interesting information, people can provide information back into the website that can be shared with the community. So if you do, if you are interested in providing anything, please go to the website and have a look. Okay. Hello? No, no, it's okay. I'm following the web. So what <laughs> um, so what am I going to cover in this presentation? So as I mentioned, we're going to cover the nationally available facilities. So we'll talk first about Archer, which a lot of people will know about. Um, I'll talk a bit about DIRAC, which is the STFC fund, the National HPC Service. The Tier 2 HPC facilities, which people may not be as aware of because they've only recently started just in the last year or so. And I'll briefly mention some of the facilities. So Archer itself. So Archer is the UK National Supercomputing Service, um, or particularly for EPSERC and NERC researchers or people working in those remits. So they're the, the cabinet, the Archer cabinets. It's a big Cray system that sits up here in Edinburgh. That's the um, Advanced Computing Facility, which is run by EPCC. And EPCC provide um, the sort of sysadmin, um, what's called service provision, creating user accounts, running the help desk, those sort of things and also the computational science and engineering support, in-depth queries, technical questions, uh, training, uh, which David, who's on, who's on this, is, leads um, ECSE projects. I'll mention, I'll come to those in a minute. So it's designed, Archer, particularly for high core count distributed memory jobs. So thing, typ typical Archer job would be something that uses a thousand or more cores, it's very traditional capability HPC. So the sort of people who've been using HPC for 20, 30 years now, material science, climate, ocean modeling, CFD, and those sort of things. That is the bulk of the Archer um, workload. Uh, there's a growing interest in non-traditional use of, or non-traditional use of HPC. So people doing data science and bioinformatics and these sorts of um, areas on Archer, but they don't constantly, at the moment, constantly a huge amount of usage on the service. I'm not going to go into real technical details about the system as these can be found on the website. Essentially the Cray XC30 uh, system, it's got almost 120,000 cores, about 5,000 nodes, and each node has two 12 core um, Xeons, uh, probably a couple of gener uh, three generations older than the current at the moment because it's getting towards its end of life, and a certain amount of memory per node. But one of the things I think Arch has proven, it's been running now for four years, maybe even close to five, no, four years now, is that it's been incredibly uh, stable and reliable. You know, there hasn't been much up and down time. It's been just churns through the science. It's very standard, it's quite a standard system. It's quite well designed and easy for people to use the traditional HPC anyway, has proved very reliable for us its lifetime. And the support for Archer is a big component, so there's the, the hardware itself, but there's a, a huge amount of um, the Archer project is around the support, which is provided both by EPCC and Cray. So there's a help desk which lets you access the EPCC and Cray expertise. We run free training all across the UK, um, and you can look on the Archer website, see what training courses are coming up. We did have um, the EC, ECSE course for software development. That's where you could find a software developer, either from um, EPCC or from anywhere, any institution around the UK or any consultant to um, improve software for Archer. Unfortunately, that final call is now closed because the service is coming towards its end of life. So the final projects for that are already from the thing going on. And the support also does a lot of benchmarking, profiling work for users and um, improving the service, improving the documentation, and all those sorts of things. And all this is provided for your point of use for the researchers, no matter who they are. If you're an Archer user, then everybody gets exactly the same service, no matter where they're from. In terms of access to Archer, there's a few different routes. There's some very, a couple of simple routes which are instant access, which you can get turned around very quickly in a matter of days um, to get access to Archer, or the driving test where you complete a short, qu a short quiz on how to use Archer. If you're UK based, you can get a small amount of time to test Archer for your use, for your research. 
And there's the resource, resource allocation panel, the RAP panel, which is the call that's open at the moment. We can request large amounts of our resource for a year, independent of a full grant application. Or you can put in a full grant access and you add the costs to the grant application. And these are notional costs for EPSA and therefore real costs for um, other grant awarding generally. And you can find more information on the different access routes at, on the Archer website at that URL there. So that's Archer. Um, I could give you, I'll briefly talk about DIRAC, um, which is the SDFC National HPC service. This is a picture of the, um, the Cosmos system at the University of Durham here. They have a slightly different model to um, the, the approach that EPSERC and NERC have, have taken, which was to provide a single, uh, or at least until recently, we'll see in a minute with the tier two systems, this has changed, a single system for people to use. DIRAC has a range of different technologies, um, which you can use depending on requirements of your research are in different systems for different um, types of research and different types of use. And they cover both the sort of capability use, which is like Archer, very bit large jobs, down to capacity, which is sort of um, high-throughput computing in general, data analysis. Um, it doesn't even have to be parallel jobs, for example. And this is because they tend to have a lot of um, data analysis of things like astronomical data um, to deal with, as well as traditional HPC jobs. So as I said, they have a variety of HPC technology. There's um, three broad service categories. There's the extreme scaling, which is the capability end, which is for applications scaling to high core counts and require high internet performance. Things like Lattice and um, quantum chromodynamics is the classic example in the SDFC unit that does that. That's based up here again at the University of Edinburgh. It's co-located with Archer and it's just been, that system is just being installed right at the moment. Um, there's the data intensive systems for um, analysis of large data sets with both modeling and uh, with modeling simulation uh, combined with the analysis that's based both at Cambridge and at Leicester, those systems in Leicester for that. Then there's the memory intensive for complex simulations, generally large um, cosmological simulations, and that's based at the University of Durham. And you can find out more about resources there. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on them. In terms of access to DIRAC, there's um, a small seed corn access, which is equivalent to the instance access for Archer, which is always available. You can contact the DIRAC service and ask for small amounts of resource to test to see whether it fits your research. And they have um, what's called the Resource Allocation Committee that reads, I think it's once every year, but it might be once every six months um, to fund larger resources, the largest request for resources. Um, and again, you can look at the website to find out more information. So I'm going to fin finish off this sort of the survey, the UK facilities, by looking at the most recent edition, which is the tier two uh, national facilities provided by um, EPSERC in collaboration with different institutions around the UK. So this follows a, a similar, recognised the need that Archer, the national service, couldn't cover all use cases um, that people wanted for their research, and neither could those um, that requirement be met by the institute purely by the institutional facilities. There was a gap between the institutional facilities and the Archer facility at the top, uh, at the high high end, that was that needed something added. And this was so EPSRC decided to fund the tier two facilities and funded a variety of different technologies. So this is along the same lines as the DIRAC model, where you have different technologies to meet different requirements um, across uh, research. So there's various systems here. You can see um, there's a few down in England and the one in Scotland, which is hosted by EPCC and Cirrus. Rather than run through them here, I'll, I've got a slide on each one of them to give a bit more information. So I'll go ahead and talk about them. Oh, sorry, I should say the different technologies. There's a few that are sort of standard Intel Xeon HPC clusters, whatever that means. There's um, the Cirrus one at EPCC, HPC Midlands Plus. Cambridge has a component that um, the Xeon cluster and the Materials and Molecular Modeling Hub down at UCL also um, has this has this um, this type of technology. But there are also some more novel technologies, different architectures. So the Jade service provides um, high performance GPU access to so the latest NVIDIA. GPUs bundled together in what are these called these DGX1 boxes, um, which don't tend to have an interconnect between the different compute nodes, but provide very powerful compute nodes for particularly machine learning um, usage. 
Cambridge um, CSD3 has some um, GPU, GPU capability. Again, uh, set out in a sort of different way, different way from Jade. They're connected by high performance interconnect. Some Xeon Phi nodes um, and a Hadoop cluster for data analysis. And one of the most interesting systems is provided by GW4, which are down in the southwest of England, called Isambard. And it's being, it's being installed sort of later this year, probably, um, I think the latest estimates are May, June sort of time frame. And it's going to be an ARM CPU-based system rather than Intel. So they've got these ARM V8 cores. It's a Cray system similar to Archer and due to be installed later this year. And that's really interesting. They've got some test technology now, which they've been doing some exploration. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So I'll go through them in turn. So Cirrus um, is designed to be to complement Archer, in particular for up in Edinburgh. So it's supposed to be more flexible. I mean, one of the challenges with using Archer, I don't know if people have experienced this or not, is that the Cray architecture is excellent for that sort of capability, MPI, thousand core jobs. I mean, that's really what it's designed to do and provides an excellent environment for that. If you want to do something slightly more esoteric, say you want to have um, a framework that launches parallel jobs, or you want to use Python in some way to launch your parallel jobs and control them and have the, this feedback loop, then the Archer architecture often can be quite restrictive and make that more difficult than it needs to be. And the Cirrus system was designed to meet those requirements while still providing the ability to scale out into the full system over the interconnect. Um, so it's a 10,000 core system and um, with an interconnect that allows you to scale up to those 10,000 cores. It can do both traditional HPC and um, generally aimed at smaller jobs than our Archer. It can also do these sort of task farming framework and type jobs I've just described. And it also provides support for doing um, sorts of parallel data science. So things like um, using Apache Spark or Hadoop can be run on um, Cirrus as well. Um, the model of um, support is very similar to Archer. There's the, very, the help desk. And no matter where you're from, you get the same service. Okay, so, and you get the access to the, all of the EPCC expertise with the help desk. Um, and it, it's got very close links with Archer, the Archer technical support, so we're able to pass experience backwards and forwards between those two companies. And there's various bits of software installed. Uh, but if you want more information on Cirrus, the links there, and you can follow that um, for all that. Um, CA3, which is the system at Cambridge, was designed to support mixed workflows. So co-locating big compute, or big commute even, as it says in my slides, I'll have to fix that uh, typo and big data to facilitate complex workflows. So if you saw, they have a really wide range of hardware from traditional CPUs, um, Xeon Phi processors, NVIDIA GPUs, and the two cluster, or sharing data, sharing um, data, sharing file systems. So you can use each different component in cloud together to do your work. Um, they provide some RSE support with, um, by collaborating with people. Um, and it's mostly based in Cambridge, but there is additional support in some of the partner institutions from CSD3. So there's a very broad range of architecture and it can be used um, together to do very mixed workflows. Um, so it's quite an interesting system in that way to explore. If you have one part of your workflow that needs CPU and then another part where you want to do some machine learning using a GPU and then maybe another part you want to do some data analytics, you can, you can link all those things together on the CSD3 system. And um, HPC Midlands Plus provide a large HPC cluster for standard HPC jobs with a wide range of software and tools to support that. They also have um, an open power system linked in, which provides some very powerful CPUs linked to GPUs and very fast uh, high bandwidth file stores for doing data analysis of very large data, data sets. Um, it's also provide a test bed to see if the open power um, architecture is useful for your um, application of your very strongly memory bandwidth limited and can also be linked in to standard HPC jobs if you want to fire off on the fly data processing to these powerful nodes while your standard HPC job keeps running on the sort of stand, more standard compute nodes. So that are, that's quite an interesting use case. Um, I don't know how much that's been taken up at the moment, but I think they're very interested in people who have that sort of requirement. Um, they, their sort of uh, model of technical support using RSEs, so we said software engineers, I'll mention them again later. If there's support for the partner institutions in HPC Midlands Plus by default, 
distributed across the consortium. There are also help desks that can help out users who may be not from those partner institutions. Um, the GW4 system, as I mentioned, isn't quite installed yet. This is a picture of the testbed system with the test arm nodes in, um, uh, housed down at the Met office in Exeter, or just outside Exeter. They get a CREXC arm based system. Um, and their idea is it's going to be a production HPC system. This isn't just going to be a testbed, but we're going to do production HPC jobs based on these arm processors rather than the sort of market which is currently dominated by Intel processors. So, and they want to do some performance comparisons, obviously, with the Intel systems and show hopefully that the ARM is competitive. And I think the early work they've done on porting on their test nodes show that the performance is really very good on ARM systems. I think one of the mis one of the common mistakes people make when thinking about ARM is that the reason everybody wants that people might want to use ARM is because it gives a low power option. And that's not strictly not true. The ARM processors here are very high performance our ARM processors, and they use roughly the same amount of power as an Intel Xeon processor. What they do do is give you more um, memory bandwidth than the traditional processor. So if your code is memory bandwidth bound, and a lot of HPC codes are memory bandwidth bound, you can get extra performance out of the ARM processor because of the extra memory bandwidth. The idea is also, I think, that they're probably a bit cheaper to purchase than Intel processors, but obviously pricing is very dynamic and can change all the time. Um, but Certainly a very interesting system. One of the reasons that's interesting is because Cray, the uh, company who also build Archer, are building in all their custom tools, their compilers, like high performance libraries, and all these sort of things for the ARM processors. And this will take away a big barrier to usage of ARM processors that has existed previously, which is that just the support wasn't there in terms of software to be able to use them easily for application codes. Um, the R, again, the support is provided by GW4 institutions in this case who have been working on these test nodes, so they should have a lot of experience with it. There's a Cray and Arm Center of Excellence associated with the system, providing um, deep technical support from Cray and from Arm engineers, and they're going to run training and hackathons to try and get codes up and running on the system um, and get people up to speed with how to use these, uh, this new technology. Um, there's only two. Uh, Two more to go, I think. Yes, two more to go. So there's Jade, which is the GPU-based system, which is made, which uses these powerful DGX1 modes. Um, these are designed pri in primarily for machine learning. That's what they've been designed by NVIDIA for. And they're incredibly powerful um, for being able to do machine learning, deep learning, and AI. Um, so if you're researchers in that area, this system is probably very interesting to you. There's also some use for molecular dynamics or the other sort of traditional EPSRC area that make big use of GPUs because they're float, often float, or they are floating point performance bound. You get a lot of floating point performance out of the GPUs, and there's some scope for other use as well. And um, for use again, the support and expertise is distributed across the partner institutions, of which there's quite a few in G. And some of the partners have committed in training courses to help people get up to speed with using these systems. The system also comes with a lot of the um, sort of traditional machine learning frameworks installed and optimized for the uh, DGX1. So things like TensorFlow from Google, for example, uh, will be av is available in an optimized form on this system. And the final system is the Materials Molecular Modeling Hub system, which is called Thomas, um, based at UCL, yeah, the system itself. Um, this one is, is a bit different from the others. The others are all available through the currently open wrap call. You can get access to all of the systems I've mentioned um, through the wrap call, but this one you can't. It was designed particularly to meet the needs of the materials and molecular modeling community and bridge the gap between their local resources and Archer. So they've been, done a lot of work to install and the software required for these communities. Um, and the access is provided instead of via the wrap, via the um, materials and molecular modeling consortia brought into the brought into the system. So that's the materials chemistry consortium and the UK Car Power Network Consortium, UKCP and MCC. Um, so you can get access through the consortia, or a lot of the people are based at partner institutions. Which are, again, there's quite a lot of those, so you can get access through that way. And there are name points of contact in the partner institutions you can get in touch with if you're uh, in the area of materials and molecular modeling and want access to this system. So 
access to tier two, apart from the tiers Mecca Modeling Hub, some of the systems, both and CSD3 in Cambridge, have a sort of instant pump priming access where you can just get quickly get access to resource to test the system, see if it's useful for you. And you don't need to go through a big application process. The resource allocation panel is open now. Um, you can apply for large amounts of time on any of the tier two resources I mentioned, apart from the tiers Mecca Modeling Hub and of course the ARM system, which isn't yet installed. Um, all of them support adding um, access on grant ac adding access on grants. So these are notional costs for EPSO because they help fund the facilities, but real costs for um, other funding bodies. And as I mentioned, the materials and records has a different model of access. So these are the sorts of national access routes. There are other access routes available for partners and local institutions. If you look on the individual websites for each of the systems, you'll see they should have information on the access routes. And you may find that there are other ways you can get access to them. Maybe you can't for whatever reason submit a wrap application or go uh, or go via one of the other grant routes. And there's just a list of the websites again. Uh, as I said, there's a link to these slides off the Archer website where the um, under the virtual tutorials section, and you can just follow the links through the slides because they're all there basically. So other HPC facilities available to UK researchers. So internationally, um, UK researchers, if they have very large HPC requirements, um, could go to PRACE, which is the pan-European HPC initiative. You get access to the very large scale European facilities based, based in various European countries. And there's a number of different core types available from small proprietary access ones to full blown um, production access. If you look at the uh, PRACE website, you'll see which calls there are and which ones are open at the moment. And you can also get access to the largest HPC for the season in the USA um, through the US Department of Energy Insight program. You really have to be able to demonstrate that your um, what you want to do scales out to huge amounts of cores. But you do get access to some very, very large, can get access to some very, very large um, systems to enable you to do things that you can't do anywhere else in the world at the moment by that program. So if you have that sort of capability requirement, it's definitely worth looking looking at that. And what I would say is that the DOE call in particular is quite competitive, so you have to have a strong case um, for that. So often you get so we talked a lot about the facilities available and the different access, but one of the key, I mean the key thing and the thing I'm involved in most of me on most of the systems is how to help people use the system because it's all very well getting access, but things always go wrong, right? And, how do you support people? What, what mechanisms are there available to support people on these systems and uh, going forward when things don't quite work out? And actually, what you really want to do is provide them with the information they require so that they can also support themselves going forward because that's usually more efficient than them having to contact different people all the time. So all of the service I've just and provide a help desk service to answer queries on the services. The level of service from the help desk differs from service to service, but everybody will answer and will um, provide a way for you to get in touch and say, this isn't working, please help me, and give access to some sort of technical resource to help you out. So that's often the first port of call for people. But there are a couple of other ways of getting help. So there's the, you're, a lot of sites now have local Archer champions. With, there was an initiative funded by EPSERC through a, an outreach grant to provide a champions framework where there would be local context where people could come and ask for advice about running HPC and where, um, where the best place was. This came out of Arch originally, but it's broadening at the moment out to cover various or the various HPC facilities I've talked about. Um, at the moment, you can find the list of names on the Archer website at this link. Um, you may find there's somebody at your local institution you can get in touch with if their name's up there it means they're happy to be contacted and have a chat to you about your requirements for hpc and um, what the right fit what the best way of going go about going about getting access and using the hpc facilities are so um, feel free to look there if you're interested in becoming a champion we're always happy to have more people along there's a champions meeting coming up in april in manchester um, so if you want to come along, you can register for that on the Archer website if you want to come along and see what it's all about. Um, it's free. Uh, you, the only thing you have to do is get yourself there um, for the workshop. And also there are the RSEs, which I mentioned, mentioned a few times already. 
the research software engineers. So there's a research software engineers association in the UK who are campaigning for the recognition of this, R what they define as the RSE role in creating a community. What it actually means is that there's a huge amount of people all across the UK who know about research software and about um, how quite often how it works in terms of the HPC. So you can go and look at the RSE website. It's a list of lists of RSE groups around the UK who are always gen always open and willing to talk to people um, about their requirements for their software and what they want for their research and things like that. And if you think you are an RSE, essentially somebody who programs software, research software, then you can join the community as well and become involved. It's a really vibrant community and it's a new thing that's sort of appeared over the last few years that's really changing the way um, research software is supported in the UK and beyond. There are now research software engineer associations in, the, in Europe and growing movements in the US as well at the moment. So in summary, um, I'm summarizing the way, uh, different ways of getting access to the system. So the very simple test access routes are via Archer Drive. If you want access to Archer, probably the easiest way is the Archer driving test. You can get access to Archer just by doing an online quiz and you get a bit of time to use however you want. Um, you can use instant access to get access to Archer or Cirrus or CSD3, um, a very lightweight application procedure. And similarly for Dirac, they have what's called the seed core access which you can use to get access to their systems to test. If, you need, if you're already using a system or you know you need a large amount of time, you want just compute time only, you can use the RAP call from EPSRC, which is the one that's open now for access to Archer and Tier 2. Or for Dirac, they have the RAC calls to access for Dirac for the SDFC unit research as well. And most of the systems, certainly the EPSRC systems, allow you to act put add access to these uh, facilities on your grants. So Archer, for example, you can put any funding body can you can request Archer resources. As I've mentioned before, the costs are just notional for EPSERC and NERC, but they're real for um, other funding bodies, similarly for tier two, except it's a notional only for EPSERC. Um, Dirac operates in a different way. They don't you don't apply for time on Dirac via grant applications, you use that RAC process I um, showed on the previous slide. Um, to get so you apply for your grants and then you apply for the competition of time to go along with your grants separately is how the SDFC model works. So all in all, there's actually one of the interesting things at the moment is there's a really wide range of HPC facilities and technologies available to UK researchers at the moment. If you include in the institutional HPC facilities, which um, the UK is really well provisioned in as well, I think for compared to most other countries, we are very well provisioned for HPC and, and have a very high diversity of HPC available to people. Um, one of the prices of having that diversity and range of HPC is there's a lot of different access mechanisms and it can get quite complicated to know where you have to go to get access for them. Um, for example, the RAP call is open at the moment. It may not be open. It will be open in a couple of months' time, for example, but you can get access that way. And there are lots of different ways to get support. The idea of the HPC UK website is to try and provide a place where you can go and find out about the um, different facilities and the access routes available in one one way, in, a, in one place. So you don't have to worry about going and searching through all the different websites as much as possible. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to try and answer any questions. I'm also happy if you want to contact me directly by my email at the start of the presentation to ask questions. If you're in the RSE community, you can also get me on the uh, Slack channel there to ask any questions. Um, thank you for your um, attention. So thanks, Andy. So that, Andy that was, I'm getting a bit of feedback. That, that was that really was useful. useful. Just a very brief thing. I mean, Andy said there, you know, how good it is that we have this range of facilities and it's great for us. That, I mean, I just reviewed an application for Archer time the other month, and rather than having to say to them, this isn't suitable for Archer, I was able to say, this isn't suitable for Archer, but it's much more suitable for this tier two system. So that's really, you know, that 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 means there's a lot more opportunities open to people for getting the right. Just because you can't run an Archer doesn't mean your research isn't good. It just means it's more cost effective to do it on a different machine. And we now have that option. There are correct horses for courses and we can direct people to the right facilities. So that's, that's really good. So I'd like to open up for questions. You're welcome to 
ask the questions in the chat window or we can try audio as well, um, whatever you want. Um, I'll mute, but you know, if anyone has any questions, just, just type it in and it'll pop up here or, or you can speak if you want. So I can also say that one of the things we're working on at the moment of a CSE team, because of this, there's this range of facilities, um, in some ways it might be a bit harder for people to choose between them. And, and I know we said there was advice available uh, to do that, but we're currently working on um, benchmarking across all the uh, tier two systems and Archer and the Dirac systems we can get access to. I'm gonna write that up and that'll show you which applications or what the difference performance of different applications looks like on the different systems. So we have a set of represent a sense of representative applications we got from the Archer user community, and um, which we're starting out with in that exercise. Um, but once that initial set's done, we may think about broadening it out onto different systems. So I'm hoping to publish. We're hoping to publish the first draft of that report. Um, in the next few months or so, uh, the next couple of months um, so that people are looking at different systems and how they perform for different applications. Okay, I can't see any questions at the moment. So I'm not hearing anybody yeah, so, uh, trying to ask questions. So maybe we'll wrap up. But feel free, um, you can, as I'm sure Andy said, you know, it's any email to the help desk, Archer help desk or whatever, we'll, or people can pick it up later. Um, yeah. Andy, I don't know, it might be best when you leave to, to stop the recording gracefully. I'm not exactly sure what happens. I'm sure it's okay if we quit, but maybe if, if you stop it gracefully, that's maybe cleaner. I'm not sure. Um, okay, thank you everybody for coming along and taking the time to join. It's always, uh, it's always good to um, have some people here to talk to. Uh, rather yeah, than thanks Andy, that was very useful. I said all this is up on the web, for, but I mean, we had a great audience today, but it's it's up on the web forevermore. So if you want to point other people at it, the, the slides for, the slides and the video and everything will be there, uh, just linked in via the way you launch the session. Okay, thanks guys.